Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to what is now the 14th edition of the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting. I'm just going to quickly run through some introductory slides and then we're going to get uh, straight into it to our first presenter. Uh, for anybody who hasn't joined us before, my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps, and I'd like to welcome you all to this morning's meeting. Disclaimer. Uh, for anyone who hasn't joined us before, just to give you a structure of the webinar, uh, we generally do these every fortnight. We've been doing them actually every week for about the last month. Uh, we get two companies in to present their story, a uh, 30 minute slot for each, comprised of a 20 minute prezzo and a 10 minute QA. If you do have any questions for the presenter, please type them in the QA box. Um, in the control panel probably at the bottom of your screen please don't use the chat function uh, the q a function is actually uh, a lot more easier for me to, to moderate and for and for the presenters uh, please note that the webinar is being recorded uh, and will be posted on the coffee microcaps youtube channel probably over the weekend or latest on monday so if, if a presenter skips over a slide a bit too quickly you can go back and rewatch it you can also go back and watch it any of the 13 previous uh, webinars that we've had, which now encompasses, uh, you know, well over 20 um, ASX microcap names. Uh, to follow us, if you don't already, on Twitter, YouTube, as I said, for this webinar and the previous webinars, LinkedIn, where I do some additional long form content. I also write a subscription uh, newsletter covering uh, ASX microcap uh, stock ideas. Um, and that can be accessed via the Substack platform. Our first presenter this morning, he's waiting in the wings, is Mr. Jim Binden from Big River Industries. And then Jim is going to be followed up by Mr. Stephen Boland from ACRO. So a strong construction industry services theme this morning. OK, I'm going to shop, stop sharing my screen now. Uh, Jim, do you want to share your screen with us? I can see the first uh, cover slide now, Jim. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Good, Mark. Uh, can you hear me okay there, Mark? I'm set to go. Yeah, perfect. I can hear you. Okay, great. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking the time to listen in on a little bit about Big River. So in, in the main, I'll have this presentation be pitched a bit more as a background uh, information about the organisation, but I'll try and weave into it wherever I can some observations on the current market and certainly happy to take some questions about that. But just a little bit for those who don't know anything about Big River, um, one of Australia's leading manufacturers and distributors of specialty products to the trade. So that's a key, that's the key first point. We don't do any retail whatsoever. So 100% trade. So, so uh, a blend of both manufacturing and distribution of a whole range of building materials, but particularly timber, steel, panels, and, uh, and a whole range of building products. We have 18 sites around Australia and New Zealand uh, servicing the major capital cities, uh, including three frame and trust sites. I'll come back to that. Um, just, uh, just on that particular point, our major focus is the larger population centres because of the blend of civil construction, commercial, a little bit of multi-res, uh, and of course, residential as well. Obviously, you don't get that same mix in smaller regional centres. Uh, so that sort of zeroes is uh, us in on the large larger population centres, probably about 150,000 people in north. Um, a, a somewhat of a specialty product focus and a long history in manufacturing creates a bit of differentiation versus, versus a lot of the other trade players who are pure distributors. Um, and of recent years in particular, a history of successful acquisition in what we see as an extremely fragmented market, um, sort of textbook case to be rolled up in our view. So expanding, expanding the business via acquisition as well as expanding the sales range uh, sorry, product range, obviously that's standard too. Uh, and we have been an active acquirer. As I said, there's probably in the order of 1,500 to 2,000 uh, hardware shops, timber yards, building supply businesses around Australia at a distribution point of view. Um, and very few of those are owned, owned at a corporate level. So, so uh, yeah, extremely fragmented uh, market, which is good for us. Uh, just a couple of sites there. We've got Geelong site, which is a prefab frame, frame and truss site in the top picture, and a couple of our sites there, Sunshine Coast and Auckland, just to give you a feel for the type of businesses we've got. 
just uh, I'll just try to put all financials on one page, obviously for the for the short time we've got here, but just focusing on the last couple of years, revenue is about 250 million last year. Um, was was up on the prior year, EBITDA under the old language, pre AASB uh, grew nicely about 25% for the year, uh, finishing in June. Um, and then obviously you can see the, obviously net pat, um, earnings per share up less so because we did a capital raise in July of last year when we acquired the two New Zealand sites. Um, and then from a uh, from a cash flow perspective, um, goods certainly one of the better results we've had for many years on operating cash flow. Uh, sure, that was aided as a touch by some of the deferrals in government um, tax and BAS, but 112% um, cash conversion ratio there. We typically run about 85, you know, touch below that the year before, although that gets impacted a little by acquisition. Uh, obviously, when we take those um, those assets on it. But yeah, you know, it impacts that a little bit. But 112% was certainly a good result for us there. Working capital trade, working capital to sales ratio, pretty key, key um, issue for us, given we've got a you know balance sheets very heavily working capital stock and debtors in particular, not very capital intensive business for us. Given manufacturing is a lesser part of our business, much larger exposure to pure distribution. Um, and the balance sheet you can see there, so you got 45 million of net working capital stock plus debtors, less creditors. Uh, gearing around that that low twenties, um, you know, again excluding the um, the right of access um, components of the balance sheet under the statutory uh, measure. Just going back to the old language, about twenty three three uh, percent. Yeah, so you can see on just on the right hand side there, um, obviously growth of revenue has been been reasonably solid. Obviously aided by acquisition as we've rolled out and expanded the network. Um, bottom graph a little bit odd but we just want, wanted to highlight uh, in particular the growth of distribution but that's the primary area where the company's growing whilst we have a couple of legacy manufacturing sites um, that we've been in for 100 years or more um, we certainly that you know the key growth of the business is in expanding our distribution network and you can see the the brown or the maroon bars there um, although there was a little dip in 2019 it's been the strong growth part of it I just quickly a little bit uh, that's sort of the financials really quickly but uh, look we our, our pitch is that we've got a really strongly diversified business model so our as, as I mentioned earlier we deal direct with the trade so we're at about six and a half thousand um, accounts um, ranging from a whole range of tier one builders form workers and civil construction companies are critical to power a whole range of internal fit out joinery businesses building contractors of all shapes and sizes so just on the pie chart there I think uh, you know, part of the reason we got through last year, notwithstanding all the challenges and still grew on all our key metrics, is, is our good exposure to all components of the construction sector. You can see there a few snippets, um, <clears throat> the commercials around a quarter of our business, which would be uh, things like offices, retail, shopping centres, hospitals, um, aged care, a whole range of things there. Uh, it's about so you know that's been good part of our business albeit that there's a little bit of a question mark about that in the next couple of years the major asset owners in that in that class have probably got uh you know probably got their hands in their pockets a little bit as far as capex is concerned given a little a little bit of uncertainty around particularly office and retail uh civil's about eight just under 10 percent of our business roads roads in particular airports you know anything that's where there's a large concrete requirement uh, I'll just come back later to some of the key products so you can understand what where 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 we play. Uh, the industrial market, so that's not going into construction. The products are being reused in in someone's process. A couple of photos there is a whole lot of plywood being used for temporary seating and temporary um, floors in the case of the Perth Arena. So that's an example where it's not on a construction site, but it's used in someone's process. And then the key resi markets, so medium density, high density, detached housing is a, is a large exposure for us. And the uh, the renovations or the alterations and additions market. So, so um, look, I think the pie chart is quite well rounded, and that's I think our high our highs um, and our lows have been less exaggerated in the construction cycle because of that spread across all those segments. Our top 50 customers all do more than half a million of sales per year. We deliver 75% of our revenue, so. So it's a sort of a high service offer to deliver to site um, you know, rather than a whole lot of walk-in traffic. Uh, and, and our largest customers have been you know, with the business for a long time, basically. Um, again, I won't go through the list on the left, but just to give you a feel for where our sites are, 
five sites in Queensland, you know, again, the bigger population centres, Townsville, Sunshine Coast, Gold Coast, and two in Brisbane. In New South Wales, we've got the two factories at Grafton and Wagga where the green diamonds are, and then the three um, sales and distribution sites in Sydney, Illawarra, and Canberra. Um, we've got sites in Melbourne and Geelong, and two sites in Adelaide and two in Perth. Uh, in Auckland, we've got uh, one main distribution site, and then a uh, a site that also has a fabrication or, or let's say light light manufacturing function. Um, so again, revenue by region just in the top right there, uh, reasonably well spread by geography as well. So a little, little over a quarter in New South Wales and ACT, southern region as we call it, around 34%, Queensland 30 and about around 10% out of New Zealand. So again, that geographic diversity as well as that segment diversity across the construction sector, I think it's, has all good well for us in recent years to. Um, and we certainly haven't seen the dip in, in, in either sales or profitability in, in FY20 that many of our peers in the building product space did experience. Just to give you a feel for some products, um, uh, obviously I've talked about a couple of segments um, that we're exposed to, but again, our internal language here in three pots. One is the formwork space. So the formwork space is, is largely about the placement of concrete. Um, you know, any kind of slab, whether it be vertical or horizontal slabs, uh, that can be in a civil application, bridges, that can be in a commercial application, you know, car parks, shopping centres, um, you know, airports, anywhere where there's a large square area of concrete and of course high-rise high buildings, whether that be offices or, or, or apartments. Some of the products we sell into that space, uh, form ply, which we manufacture at our two sites, as well as import out of China. Um, LVL beams are used to hold hold up the structure. Steel, which we've, we have three steel rolling lines uh, where we're rolling a permanent form, formwork product. Um, we have wall systems, obviously again, for the placement of concrete uh, and then a whole range of accessories. So source both internally from our own factories and externally from both here and overseas. Lower gross margin part of the business, um, albeit that, uh, that you know, stock turns and so forth are extremely high there because it's a high volume part of the market. So look, one of the things about that sector, it's, there's a reasonable first mover advantage. Obviously that's the first stage of any structure is the concrete shell. Um, so it does put us in a reasonable position uh, to be first on site. And then you know, obviously because we're exposed to other components of the construction cycle as well, um, you know, we're well positioned to talk to the other contractors, whether it be the building contractor, the internal fit out or the joinery joinery contractor who follows who follows that formwork stage. So I think it's a useful um, you know, position to have at the beginning of a construction job. Uh, the second segment we talk about is our plywood and specialty, again, heavily leveraged to our long history in the timber industry. Uh, the company's been around 120 years or so. Big River itself was actually incorporated in 1920, so it's 100 years this year. There's a few preceding companies, but all part of the same family business. So. Um, Decorative flooring, which you'd see in your own house or uh, or in commercial applications, hardwood flooring, a whole range of plywoods again, which leverages our manufacturing sites um, for both structural, civil, uh, commercial, and 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 architectural products. Um, and uh, yeah, so again, whilst we import some really key products out of both Asia and Europe, uh, we've obviously got our manufacturing exposure at the three sites that are heavily focused around those you know, that product range. So for the commercial fit out. Uh, joinery, uh, any kind of appearance grade products. And then on the structural side, uh, many, many applications for, for structural plywood, um, from flooring and mezzanines to cladding, um, and then to, to civil, uh, civil applications as infills and, and, and bridges. Um, we do a range of, we do a range of prefab uh, and light, lightweight engineered timber bridges, particularly for regional roads. So that's been a, 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 a particularly good growth part of the business in recent years. Again, internal and external supplies, certainly you know, much higher gross margin in that specialist area. And the, and the, and the third part of our business, which is called general building products, uh, typically would, would go into residential construction, both detached housing and medium density projects. Um, very large markets, well north of $10 billion. Um, it's around 55% of our revenue at the moment, but yeah, we're we'd say we're barely scratching the surface of that. So some of the key products, which you might be familiar with, frame and truss, which is the structure of a house, obviously, both the roofing and the uh, prefab walls. Fibre cement sheeting, we're very uh, strong with James Hardy, they're a key supplier of ours. 
been a particularly good growth part of our business pine framing, which is used again in the structure. Structural LVL is obviously the heavy, heavy lintel applications and so forth. We have a pre, we, we have an aerated concrete panel product called Maxi Wall and Maxi Floor. So again, that's lightweight, fast construction, but really strong thermal and acoustic properties of a uh, of a light rate, lightweight concrete panel. And then a whole range of builders' hardware, door and door furniture, hardwood beams and posts and decking. So anything you'd find, not only in your own house, but in, in a row of townhouses, villas or, or, or constructions of that type that are built out of light, lightweight rather than bricks or concrete. That gives you a little bit of a mix for, for the products and some images there, just give you a sense for, for the type of things we're involved with. Um, you know, again, a blend of both internal and external suppliers. Um, which, which certainly does give us a little bit of a point of difference in the market. Most of our competitors, we would say, uh, are just traders, so they don't have that manufacturing position. So whilst on the building product side, you know, we're probably, um, you know, in a similar like-for-like -like position in the other two segments, you know, we've got a, some, some key differentiation um, leveraging that, 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 uh, that customised manufacturing position, which, which we have. Just lastly, just to give you a sense of the industry, you know, I've spoken about it being right for consolidation. Um, we do have a leading position, albeit we're a very small dot in a big market. Um, you can see there we're heavily exposed to trade. Um, and, and this image just tries to also represent larger versus smaller format stores. So everyone knows the big green box in the bottom right, obviously extremely dominant in retail, very large, you know, well over $12 billion in revenue, I think last year, maybe more than that now. Um, and then Bunnings Trade, which you may be less familiar with, are the white boxes. There's around 32 of those in Australia. That hasn't expanded over the last seven or eight years or so. Um, it's, it's, it's remained stagnant while the green boxes have grown, but you know, there's certainly some of, those, um, some of those boxes around the country, uh, obviously reasonable size and heavily trade focused, the same as our business. Uh, Met Cash, obviously, which acquired the might of 10 home timber and hardware businesses. Um, a blend of both corporate owned stores and, and their affiliated wholesale stores, a little bit more exposed to retail than our business um, and some smaller for, format stores. Um, look, the big one is the non-affiliated. There's, there's around 700 plus non-affiliated bulky building products, timber yards, hardware businesses, um, you know, that play in our space as well. Many of the, the acquisitions we've done have been obviously uh, privately owned businesses, owners coming to the end of their working life that kids off doing other things and um, and yeah you know, the classic textbook succession issues there um, so so yeah look in summary there 12 billion dollar plus space um, you know, our revenue only 250 million at this stage but a highly frag fragmented market largely about private ownership when you take out obviously the dominance of Bunnings in retail um, which as I mentioned we're not really exposed to so so we see that as a, a real classic case for us to continue to expand our network. 18 sites across Australia, we believe we're barely scratching the surface. We've, we've got some strong relationships with um, peers who have 18 sites in one city and they're just in trade. And, and, and their turnover is substantially higher than Big River private companies that, that, that we're close to. So that's the, you know, that's the size of the prize in our view um, in what's an attractive market. Um, and perhaps you've just got maybe one or two minutes left before we start the questions, just on the market now, you know, I think in general, I've been talking to some of our larger suppliers just in the last day or two. I think, you know, the summary from my perspective is, um, so, you know, I think the, the, the industry is very well positioned. We're already four years into a, a residential construction decline. I think that's what's very different from other, other um, with periods of dislocation like the GFC and so forth, when when we're when we're at um, sort of historic peaks of the cycle, residential construction has already been in decline for four years. Um, so I so I think you know the usual risk of oversupply and overhang of product certainly doesn't exist now. Um, so I think the upside in the medium term, particularly once we get past you know the next few months, is is very positive. Um, the stimulus from the government obviously substantially helps that picture as well. Um, so I think in general, the industry has been very resilient during the last six months, probably surprised all the players, including the larger public companies in terms of what their expectations were. I think the industry's done, you know, materially better than what everyone expected. Um, and yet we're still at, effectively at the low point of the residential construction cycle. So, 
you know, we think that uh, we as a company and certainly others are very well placed to benefit from that uplift in the cycle, albeit that there might be a little pause until we get back to sensible uh, immigration levels and also, you know, uh, let's say national students kind of return to a, let's say a moderate level um, you know, before that primary demand really starts to increase. But I know some of the big players are already starting to talk about potential shortages of housing in the near term, near term being within a couple of years. So um, I think the industry is very well placed, notwithstanding some of the challenges in the economy at the moment. And, uh, and our business has held up surprisingly well. Okay, Mark, um, I just go back to you. That's I think on one time there to maybe start the question time. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we've got a good few questions, so let's try and rattle through as many as we can. Um, uh, one question is, is having a national brand network your major advantage for the trade customers who are you know, looking for short supply lines and, and I guess lower freight handling costs? Uh, yeah, for sure, Mark. And, and whoever asked that question, thanks for that. that look, we, we're getting more and more builders who are starting to travel beyond their traditional markets. Um, so in the past, there's some really sticky sticky relationships with local stores and that's also why acquisition works well for us because there is strong goodwill and sticky relationships with customers but having said that more and more you know we're seeing these builders starting to spread into other markets so having those outlets in other markets um, is a really good way to be able to add value to those types of builders um, where we've already got a relationship with them in Queensland for example and then they've set up a, a division in Geelong or in Melbourne and we're, you know, we're there and ready with, with the relationships and knowledge um, already in place. So yeah, that's been a really good part of our expansion. And I think it's a good offer given there's not many national players. There's some really, really dominant and good quality local businesses in one city or in one region. Um, but apart from really Mitre 10, which is sort of corporatized, um, there's no one really with that national footprint um, of distribution sites. So we need to continue to expand that and and it will be a compelling offer for those larger customers that are spread across different geographies. Okay, and then the next one is on revenue. It's kind of linked to your slide about, um, you know, your largest customers. But what portion of revenue comes from, let's say, the, the non-top tier contractors? And like, how do you manage credit risk, I guess, with the top tier guys? Um, and I guess some of, you, some of those smaller customers, especially in an environment like this. Yeah, well, look, it's, a, it's a, always been an important part of the business. I've been in the company for 20 years and certainly data management's, you know, it's it's always the number one game in town, always has been. We have credit insurance. We've always taken that out. So that's somewhat, you don't want to have to rely on it, but it's certainly a position that we've always had. Um, our largest customer is only 3% of our sales. Um, and then the next biggest after that is less than 1% of our revenue. So um, we have a very well spread ledger um, so hence we don't have huge exposures to any one customer so yeah very close management all our debtors are decentralized managed with within the stores obviously where there's that relationship with the customer not someone in a foreign office um, calling chasing debt so that's one of the ways we've managed to so I'll blend of that close relationship on the ground within the regions uh, credit insurance and and the fact that we have that very well diversified ledger certainly is somewhat of a hedge in itself and then the profit differential between distribution and manufacturing. Um, I guess they want to know, how do you decide what to manufacture, what makes sense to just do it on a distribution model? Yeah, good question. So in some cases, probably the best uh, textbook example to give you is a few years ago, we've run both uh, plywood factories 24-5 or 24-6 days a week. Um, what we started to do was we just decided that the low end commodity range is simply uncompetitive for us to manufacture that in Australia. So we now bring about 60 boxes a month out of China of the low end plywood range, again, products that we used to manufacture at our own factories. So in that case, we've now chosen to import those and we've wound back the scale of our own factories and focused them on the top end value added product range. So um, it's it's largely financially based, to be honest. It sounds a fraction callous, and we have scaled back the size of our mills and hence our workforce accordingly. But um, obviously, we've got to decide where, where we've got a competitive advantage. So because of our strong position with the customer, you know, that's obviously our number one asset in my view. Uh, we can change our supply chain, uh, obviously, without jeopardising the offer that we've put, 
that we provided the customer. If that's locally made, great. If it's imported, that's also fine. So, so yeah, to some extent, there's that trade off between the import supply chain and, lo and locally manufactured. A lot of our other products, however, we don't have a manufacturing capability. So we're just traded from the large building materials players in Australia and overseas, whether that's the likes of James Hardy, Borrell, CSR, Carter Holt Harvey out in New Zealand, um, yeah, larger, larger building product players, um, BGC in the West, uh, and then obviously all the international sourcing. So, so pretty ruthless financial assessment of what what makes sense to manufacture versus just trading. Okay, great. And I had a question emailed in ahead of time, and we've got one uh, through the through the live as well. We're basically asking the same thing um, around supply chains. How have supply of imported products been? impacted during COVID and has has that returned to normal? Uh, well, it did and now it's not. So um, certainly initially, there was some concern given our exposure to China in February and March. Um, got through that period very well. Um, there was no stock outages of the key product lines that we bring out of there or Europe for that matter. The Europe uh, products, we don't bring in quite as frequently. So we had enough product on the ground there, slightly longer lead time out of Europe. But more recent times have been major, major changes. Um, perhaps the person who asked the question is aware of that. So there is some problems um, with shipping availability and pricing particularly. Um, so yes, we've, we've probably had to increase our safety stock levels a little bit in the last month, um, being aware of that difficulty getting space on ships. Freight, freight rates have probably gone up fourfold, fourfold out of China um, in the last two months, huge spike. Um, so how long that lasts, probably yet to be seen, um, but certainly ourselves and other suppliers we deal with regularly and closely, we bring a lot of product out of uh, Europe, um, are certainly seeing the same problem. So yes, re-emergence re of that problem just in the last couple of months was very smooth from say April to August. Um, and this issue's up in the last two months. We've got uh, 50 boxes on the water at the moment, a few problems getting into Sydney as well, as you'd be aware. Um, but in general, we're well positioned. We've probably increased our safety stock plan um, just during this period of uncertainty. So, and the flip side, the, the only positive I can say is there has been um, strong demand on our manufactured sites uh, because of the challenge of people, particularly on plywood, who have been able to import plywood, which is a significant percentage of the Australian market. That's been very challenging for some players. So we've, we've found our order book um, for our locally made product is particularly strong. And then also post-COVID, perhaps the final point is that I feel as perhaps a small sentiment moves kind of back towards the Australian made product. Um, look, I wouldn't say that there's a clear trend line there, more anecdotal that there's, you know, we've had a handful of customers say, look, we don't want the Chinese stuff, we want the Australian made stuff. So yeah, where that goes, I mean, it's, a, it's materially cheaper, the product from China. So I'm not sure, I wouldn't say that's going to translate across the whole market, but that is a factor as well, perhaps. But I think our, our multiple supply chains, we deal with five plants in China and, and, and a whole lot in Europe. So we're not, we're not exposed to one player or one destination. Uh, and together with our Australian manufacturing assets, I think our diverse supply chain is going to serve us really well. But certainly there are shortages starting to appear in the market because of that, that challenging freight situation. Uh, and then try and get in these last few if we can, Jim. Um, uh, further expansion into is, I mean, you're based in Auckland, but does Auckland also service Wellington or is there scope to have something in Wellington and then, I guess, something in Christchurch to, I guess, service that South Island? Uh, yep, spot on. So those two markets absolutely are on our radar. So, you know, obviously both meet that population um, metric I spoke of, which gives them a good blend of all those construction types you saw on that pie chart. So we're in discussions with someone in Christ, which has been for a little while. Um, we've got acquisition discussions in all four of our regions, Queensland, New South Wales, uh, Southern and, and New Zealand. And we need that. We need a good 20 in, in the top of the funnel for three or four to drop out the bottom of the funnel in our experience. Um, that's probably the ratio you need. So yes, yep key markets for us to, and whilst we do service uh, those two centres out of Auckland, um, clearly we'd be in a much stronger position with a you know, footprint on the ground there. So that's certainly part of our medium term strategy, yes. Great. Jim, we're going to have to leave it there. I don't think we've got to all the Great. questions, but I'm keen to get uh, Steve, our next presenter, off um, 
on time. So th yep. thank you very much for, for your time this morning. And uh, okay, thanks, Mac. If you can just stop the stops and share, yep. Yep. Yeah. And then okay, thank you. Thank you. And then Steve, uh, if you want to start sharing your screen. Thank you, Mark. Just, uh, here we go. I can see all... your cover slide now, Steve. You can see it. Terrific. Okay, great. Okay, thanks, Mark. Well, we'll um, I'll get cracking. And, and thanks, folks, for taking the time today to uh, hear a bit about the Acro story. Okay, so um, just give you today a quick background of the of the business over the last two years since we since we listed in April 2018. Some of the major developments over that period. An update on the FY20 results and also what we're seeing is the outlook into the new year. Um, so firstly, um, just to describe our business, we are a leading provider of engineered formwork solutions and scaffold hire across all of Australia. Um, the business um, was a long-term asset of Boral, sold it at private equity around 10 years ago and taken out of private equity to uh, listed in April 2018. So just on this first page to give you some of the highlights of the business at the moment. Firstly, just on terms of our share price, particularly pleased at the moment that our, our current price is as high as it's been for the last 18 months. Um, you can see we're listed at 20 cents. We're trading sort of circa 30, between 35 and 38 at the moment. Um, and certainly since the, uh, the, the COVID sort of hit about six months ago, we've had extremely strong bounce back. And, you know, I think we've probably bounced back as well as anybody in the uh, in the construction sector in terms of our of our, of our share price, um, we have six we operate in six states and ten depots, thirteen hundred customers, two hundred forty five employees. Market cap is sort of circa about eighty at the moment. Um, our annualised revenue going into the new financial year that we're in at the moment will be a bit over one hundred million. We've got one hundred thirty million dollar replacement value of assets. Um, as I mentioned, we listed in twenty eighteen and um, just safety, which is obviously a very strong focus for all businesses, but for us especially, we're very proud of our safety record over the last uh, four years that we've measured that, uh, that we've gone from you know, high sort of 19.7 lost time injury frequency rates to 2.4. I mean, that, that's representative of only three lost time injuries in the whole of the business last year. So um, we're pleased with that result clearly. Um, the broad strategy of the business, um, firstly, um, we want to become, and we're very fast becoming, the leading engineered formwork sales and hire equipment solutions provider in Australia. I'll talk a little bit shortly about the pivot that we made um, two years ago to focus less on residential and commercial construction and more on civil infrastructure construction um, and how that's um, played out in the business and, and why we think that's been so important to our success. Um, second point is um, we've now got a very strong focus around the industrial scaffold market. So it's quite a different market to residential and commercial. Um, the major differences between, I feel like former civil infrastructure and, and also industrial scaffolding versus uh, residential and commercial is it's not a price driven market primarily. Um, the residential and commercial access scaffolding market is very, very price driven, very commoditized, not a lot of differentiation. Um, however, in industrial scaffolding, where you're dealing with you know, oil and gas and power stations and mining, um, where it's, it's what you're doing is you know, providing access equipment for major shutdowns, um, safety and quality and all the things that are also important in formwork uh, into civil infrastructure is very important also in the industrial market. And, um, and one of the acquisitions that we made last year, Unispan, has given us an entry into the industrial scaffold market. The returns are tremendous and we now want to grow that nationally. Um, recruit, train and retain the best management engineering talent. Engineering is incredibly important to our business. Um, we employ now roughly 30 odd engineers. Our national engineering manager is a 30 year old guy who's come out of our business over the last eight years. Um, our engineers are focused on customer solutions. They're not, um, you know, they're, they're, whilst their, their technical ability is high, they, are work, they work with our clients to get the best possible solution. So it's a real value added part of the business. A lot of cases it's our engineering smarts that actually wins us the work on some of the major projects that I'll refer to a little bit later in the presentation. Um, we, we've now got great organic growth opportunities. Um, we, and I'll, again, I'll talk shortly about the two major acquisitions or the two acquisitions we've made since we became a public company. That's now given us ability to open up new channels for um, hire and sales of products into markets that 
we've never previously operated uh, those sorts of products in and the businesses we bought also didn't previously operate but because of our geographic spread we've got the ability to open up a whole range of new channels and it's uh, actually working extremely well at the moment and finally um, we are in a, uh, you know, a, a a acquisitive business we've made two acquisitions and we're we are still on the lookout for others that fit the the mold of exactly what it is that acro wants to do with our our uh, it helps us meet our mission of becoming that, that you know that formwork leading formwork company and the leading engineered um, industrial scaffold company. Key financials for last year: um, our revenue of eighty seven million was up twenty two percent. I've mentioned that we go into the new financial year now where we'll be over a hundred. Um, we had a eight month contribution of an acquisition of a business called Unispan in that last year. Um, EBITDA pre double ASB, which is still at the moment to me far more important than the other. Um, $15 million up 30% on the previous year. NPAT of 9 million was up 20% on the previous year. Our net debt did increase by just under $11 million. And that was effectively the cash, a bit less than what the cash was paid out for the uh, the acquisition that we made. EPS went up by 5% to 4.6 cents per share. We declared a, a 1.05 cents dividend um, that we're paying in a few weeks and operating cash profit also up 27% to 11.2 million. So. Uh, another very strong year, and uh, I'll show shortly in the presentation that you know this, the seventh year in a row now of growth of profitability within our business. So I'm going to focus on six major points within um, over the last two years that have helped get the business to the position we're in today. First one I mentioned was this pivot away from residential and commercial scaffold and more to um, civil infrastructure, primarily in formwork. Um, you can see on that chart that um, it's basically turned on its head over the last four years. So when we became a public company, we, we had you know, circa sort of 50 to 60 percent of our earnings were coming out of commercial and residential scaffolding. Um, that's now 25 percent. So in the, in, the, in the financial year just completed, we had 75 percent of earnings come out of formwork and industrial scaffold and only 25 percent in, in um, residential commercial scaffold. Um, the, the, the one thing I will say about that residential commercial market is, and you know, I heard Jim speak earlier and he's correct. It's, in a, it's been in a low point for probably the last three to four years. Um, we're probably not as confident. Well, I think it's uncertain how quickly that will return. Clearly it will return at some point, but I would describe that as, as, at best as uncertain, where as the formwork business and the civil infrastructure pipeline um, is not uncertain. That's extremely strong. Um, I, I think we've actually got a two pace construction economy now in Australia. If it's government funded, you're gonna be in for a good time. If it's privately funded, it's uncertain as to how, you will, uh, how, how you'll go for this next period. But um, we're very fortunate that we made that decision two years ago and now the, the, you know, the impacts of COVID have made that even a, a better decision um, in that you know, we're now on, on a range of major civil infrastructure projects that are going at a a, a cracking pace. So that's um, that's been a successful pivot. Um, and it's an area we want to continue to concentrate on. Again, the formwork part of the business is um, highly engineered, highly, uh, it's it's a specialist area. Um, it's every job has a, has a difference to it. Um, it's really customer solution orientated work rather than, um, you know, I don't want to underplay the requirement for scaffold around a building, but um, access scaffold is not the most important part of the construction, but when you're propping up the, the laying of concrete in, you know, bridges and tunnels, etc., um, it's incredibly important that you get you get the whole process right. Um, second thing I want to focus on here is is our I think we've now positioned ourselves incredibly uniquely in the Australian market um, to be able to offer the range of services and products. Uh, and service the different markets that we can across the whole of Australia. And look, there is actually no company in our particular space who's in formwork and scaffold hire, who actually operates across the geographies that we do and operates across all of the product ranges that we do. I mean, there's companies that are national, but they just do scaffold. There are companies that are almost national, but they just do formwork and they don't do any scaffold and don't do any industrial scaffold. Um, we also have a screens business platform that we purchased. There's, you know, we don't really have a national competitor in the screens market. So, you know, we've, I think it's a, one of the major competitive advantages that ACRO has is the, um, is the, is the geographies that we operate in, uh, the network that we have and the ability to move product around and, and you know, and, and, and now open up significant new channels for growth. 
um, that I'll touch on shortly in, in relation to some of the products that we've now got as part of our range of, via the acquisitions that we've made. Um, so we have made two acquisitions since we've become a public company. We purchased a business called Natform in August 2018. Um, they provide protective screens on um, medium and high-rise high developments. So that's, you can see in the photo there, that's actually the opera apartments being built, which is just about complete at the moment. Um, the screens that are on the top of that building are provided by us. Um, effectively, the screens enable, the screens move up with the building rather than scaffold that um, has to stay sort of from ground up. Um, so you know, this is a, a product that um, has now become sort of well you know, accepted nationally. Um, Natform was one of the pioneers of that. The business of Natform was owned by one owner for about 25 years since she started the business. Um, she still actually is now a director of, of uh, the public company for Acro. Um, that, that, so that, that, that's now, that, that sort of screens market has now expanded. There's a number of players, but I think you know, Natform brand, certainly in New South Wales and Queensland, has been the market leader for a, you know, for a long period of time. Um, we now have uh, a, a great opportunity to develop that product across the country. We've opened up a business in Victoria that uh, pre the previous owner did not have. We're already doing extremely well out of that. We've done a couple of jobs in South Australia and we've got our eyes open in WA and TAS. Um, this, it's fair to say that there was, there was a reasonably slow start when we purchased this business, but it's really we've really hit our straps in the last six to nine months. Uh, we've had our highest profit quarter since the acquisition in the fourth quarter of 20, that's continued into the new financial year. Um, and you know, as, a, as at the end of September, we'd already secured about 50% of the, of the annual budget for, for this business in new work, including the job that I mentioned there, $1.1 million job with uh, Meritons and Parramatta. That's the biggest single screens job this business has won in its history. Um, we've got some great young enthusiastic management in that part of the business now. And, you know, I've got high ambitions to grow that further. It also allows us um, to, to enter some new products that complement um, the screens. We've now got a handrail product that we've developed that goes hand in hand with our screens. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's really, um, as I said, after a reasonably slow start, uh, I, I now think this is a, one of the, you know, one of the real, uh, you know, sort of benchmark parts of the Acro business going forward. Uh, the other acquisition that we made, which is completely transformational to the whole of the, the Acro business, was to purchase Unispan in October 2019. Um, Unispan were primarily a Queensland-based business, about 90% of their revenue in Queensland, a little bit in New South Wales. Um, highly complementary formwork equipment to Acro. The, the photos that I've, I've showed there is actually a job that we've just completed in, uh, in Townsville, which is a, 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 a site called Sun Metals. It's a zinc refinery. And what we've been, what we've doing there is basically providing the support for the development of a, of the uh, of a, another part of the refinery, and that that's a combination of using Unispan equipment and Acro equipment together. Now that you know previously, obviously we wouldn't have done that. Unispan would have got, had to hire or cross hire from somebody, and we may have had to cross hire if we were going to do the job. But we were able to do the job completely using um, gear from Unispan and Acro, um, and then also as I mentioned that. The acquisition has brought us into this industrial scaffold market. Now it's only focused in Queensland at the moment, but we've got strong ambitions to grow that business nationally. We know we can. Um, we've got an excellent reputation as a service provider in the Queensland market for industrial scaffold. Um, we just won recently, um, we'll, we'll re-won our origin energy contract that generates about $5 million a year of revenue for another three to five year term in Queensland. Um, the other very attractive part of this acquisition to us that's been really has been the game changer is that um, the, our, our major competitors in the formwork space are all uh, Australian subsidiaries of European manufacturing companies. Now, we, as Acro, we previously, whilst we were, a, you know, we were a strong formwork company, we didn't have any specific relationship with a manufacturer that allowed us to stay at the cutting edge of development in this industry because it's a very, yeah, it, it's, it, it is a dynamic industry. Unispan had the Australian distribution rights for Olma, who are a Spanish manufacturer of formwork equipment. Um, we now enjoy that arrangement. We've, we've entered into a new agreement with Olma that also now includes New Zealand. So we're the sole distributor of their products in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, that gives us a significant edge. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's opened up a whole range of other opportunities to us now in sale of product as well as hire a product that I'll touch on shortly. 
Uh, the other thing about the acquisition is that, you know, it was a, a true integration opportunity. Uh, there's over $2 million worth of cost outs that we've, we, we've, we've now successfully achieved. Um, for example, at, you know, Unispan had three depots, two in Queensland and one in New South Wales. Of those three depots, two of them have been closed and we now only operate one of their depots in, um, in Queensland. So we're able to consolidate all their other work into our you know, existing network. And that saves sort of circa $800,000, $900,000 in rents. So it's, it's been a very successful acquisition. Um, very good people have come out of the Unispan business into ACRO. And you know, again, uh, I think this is, this is the real transformational thing that's happened to our business over the, over the last two years. Um, I mentioned another year of EBITDA growth. So you can see from this chart, going back to 15, every year we've made, have had a better result than the previous year. Every, every year the margins have improved, um, you know, we, and we go into the new financial year. Um, you know, we obviously we have three and a half months through this story is continuing. So uh, it's, you know, we, we, we pride ourselves on continued growth. Um, definitely got solid contributions for the two acquisitions. Uh, but we have also invested fairly significantly in capital in the former part of our business. Uh, and, you know, we, we don't get less than 40% returns on any of the capexes that we, that we uh, for growth, that we've purchased over the last couple of years in our, uh, in our former area. The other thing that's emerging, and it's really actually been quite interesting that it's really, really emerged in the last six weeks. We've known it was a possibility, but now it's starting to happen. Unispan um, were definitely better than Acro in terms of their purchasing ability. So purchasing both capital equipment and um, sales stock um, and, and maintenance stock. Definitely Unispan had a better program for that than Acro did. We've now got one of the previous owners from Unispan as our national procurement manager. And it's been quite amazing how much better he is buying than what we had seen in the past. So we're now seeing significant benefits and I'm talking as recent as our, our current sort of forecast for our current month's P&L for products that, we're, that we, uh, we purchased for on sale, um, we were buying now for sort of anywhere between 10 and 30% cheaper than what we were previously. So that, that opens up a lot of opportunity for us in terms of either growing margin or growing volume or a combination of both. Um, so that's, that's uh, very pleasing. We, we thought it was gonna uh, be an opportunity and it's now definitely coming to, coming to the fore. This, um, I, I, I was going to put a slide about COVID, but I decided not to. I sort of thought I'd touch on it here, which is around um, what our current pipeline looks like and the work that we've won over the last period. It's, it's actually been pretty remarkable, really, that um, in this period of uncertainty, we've actually had our best six months in terms of new hire contracts one. You can see um, the second half of 20 was up 62% on the same period last year in terms of jobs won and the pipeline is significantly up. Um, we haven't had to shut any depots. We've had no, we haven't lost a day um, in, in Victoria. In fact, we go from strength to strength in Victoria at the moment on all the major civil projects. So it's been a very good story for us over this period. Uh, we did a range of um, cash saving measures early. We got six months deferral on our principal debt payments with our, to, with our bank. Um, we got a whole bunch of rent reliefs you know, saving around about a million dollars in rent payments by renegotiating the lease terms to give our landlords longer term certainty so we could secure some short term rent free periods. Um, we've had a very good period over this last six months. Um, and the high contracts in the current pipeline are a strong indicator of the success of what's been going on over that period. A few of the major jobs we're on. I mean, it's, it's been a big turnaround for this business in the last two years. We're on the biggest civil infrastructure projects you can think of in the country. And here's just an example, Sydney Metro, Melbourne Metro, the Melbourne Western Distributor Road um, contract free, freeway development, and now it's starting on uh, Snowy Hydro. So we've, we're well positioned and we've had a lot of success on all of those major projects. Snowy, it's very early stages, but I'm thrilled that we've supplied the very first formwork equipment onto that job. We've basically provided the launching pad for the tunnel boring machines that are going through that right now. Uh, it was a small sale of $300,000 worth of gear, but it's very, uh, very important to be the first, first player on that, on that job. And that, that's the, that is the major civil project across the country, probably over the next five years. Further to that, just, you know, some of you may have seen this sort of stuff before, but it's still very relevant. Civil infrastructure is by no means at its peak. You can see where we are at 
sort of mid 2020 to where we'll be by you know 2023. So there's still significant growth. I'm pleased to say that almost all of those major projects that are on the right hand side of that page, Acro's got uh, a strong foothold on now, um, some more than others. Uh, the major rail projects, the next big one to kick off is the Cross River Rail project in Queensland, um, where we'll start seeing significant revenues probably in the early new year from that. Um, but this is the story um, and it's not changing. And, and again, given the government support for this space, it's going to only get better in our view. State of the markets, again, just give you a quick indication of what we think at the moment. Civil is very strong in Queensland and Victoria. We're in a bit of an abeyance in New South Wales. There's some of the projects that have been going for the last couple of years stop and new others start. Um, but you know, across the country, civil is very good. Commercial is reasonable in everywhere bar probably WA. Um, residential is in, very, in our view, very soft in Queensland and New South Wales and sort of stable-ish elsewhere, but um, very soft still in Queensland and New South Wales. And thankfully, it's not that relevant to our story anymore. So into the outlook for the new year, um, quarter one trading has commenced in line with fourth quarter 20, albeit um, actually a little bit better than we thought. So we, you know, we have three and a half months in and um, we're reasonable point ahead, of, ahead on our budget. Uh, to what we expected. Um, the Melbourne lockdown had absolutely no impact on us whatsoever. Civil infrastructure continued. Um, and it, it actually, we actually have had two months in the months of um, September and now looking like October where we've recorded record high revenue numbers in Victoria for the business. So that's been obviously very pleasing. Um, we've talked about the new sales that we've secured over the last four months. In this, into this year, that the main drivers for further growth on our profitability will be the 12 month contribution now of Unispan instead of eight, including all of the cost outs, getting the full year benefit. Um, this opportunity um, to develop our, our, our products across the country, expand our capabilities and offerings across all of the country. Um, we're now really, really focused on opening up new channels. It's so important to the business where we can open up a channel for sales and hire that we didn't previously had off the back of the range that we now have talked about civil infrastructure projects. Um, our, our sales, sale of product now has become very important to the business. We've just, um, we've just launched an online sale. So yeah, we're talking about sales here. We actually sell timber and ply in a small way competing with Big River in a very small way. Um, and we sell a range of other products to form workers. And it's now, I, I think, you know, we'll, we'll have probably $30 million of revenue coming out of sales up from probably 10 or 12 12 months ago in the next uh, in the next couple of years. Um, there is a rebound in activity from industrial. There were some of the shutdowns in the industrial market in Queensland were delayed. They're now being reactivated and we're continuing to get very good growth out of the net form business in New South Wales and Victoria. And as I said, I, I think there's a risk in the commercial residential area, but I, you know, I, I, again, I'm gonna couch it as being uncertain rather than good or bad. Um, the, the two brokers who cover us have a current pre asb forecast for us ranging between 17 and 17.5 EBITDA for this year. We don't normally go out with predictions, but we're, we're saying at the moment that we're comfortable with those forecasts. And, you know, we expect to see obviously civil infrastructure continue to be very strong for the next period of time. Um, finally, just to give it sort of round out what it is that we're really focusing on as, as, as the strategy now specifically for this year. Number one, as I mentioned, new clients, new markets, expand and promote the capabilities and expertise across the business, develop the national footprint for industrial scaffold, including potentially looking at acquisitions in this area. Um, now that we've got an online um, platform for sale of product, um, really growing that product sales with very strong focus, we've had extremely good early results from our online program. Um, we wanna make ourselves as easy as possible for customers to deal with when they wanna buy rather than hire. In the commercial scaffold area, you know, whilst we don't, we're not specifically looking to grow in that area, we know it will come back at some stage. What we're just watching there at the moment is what's happening with a range of competitors who are under a lot of duress. Companies that only do commercial residential scaffold are not having a good time. And um, yeah, there may be some opportunities for us to pick up some market share there fairly, fairly easily um, and position ourselves for when that, that, that market does come back as it will do sometime in the next few years. Um, continue to really focus on the engineering team and the capabilities of our engineering team. Um, it, that with our geographic spread and product range, they are the, they are the acro competitive advantages. And the last point, um, 
interesting to me, I've been running this business for seven years now. When I started, we were probably the last last port of call for people come, wanting to come into the industry. The company had a pretty bad reputation. I think that's the complete reverse now. Um, we've been able to attract some very, very good people who've had a lot of experience working for some some of our competitors in some some way. Uh, and that continues uh, almost on a you know two or three month basis. We're able to attract new people into the business with high expertise. Um, that are attracted to what uh, Acro can present them now. Um, so that, I think, wraps up pretty much slightly over time, potentially, uh, Mark, but back to you now for uh, any questions. Um, yeah, we've got a couple of questions. Um, uh, I know you're talking about organic growth opportunities on this Sunday. Somebody's just asking about, um, you know, expansion into the New Zealand market, probably in the in the farm work business, um, I guess, rather than the scaffold business, given... Uh, what you what you've said about it in the Australian market is that Honda cards? Uh, look, we've got an eye to it. We 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 you know we strategically got the rights to the Alma products to distribute in New Zealand for that reason. Um, we've had some discussions with companies over there. Look, we're not rushing into the New Zealand market, but certainly we have an eye on it. Um, and, and you know there there will be an opportunity at some point, whether it be via acquisition or via partnership. With some with another company, or you know, just setting up some footprint ourselves. Um, but yeah, we certainly have an eye to it. Yeah. And then another question around acquisitions, actually. Um, future acquisitions is that more about getting access to products, or access to customers and markets, uh, or, or where would acquisitions come from, uh, or be targeted in the future? Look, the next the next area we think is the industrial scaffold area uh, outside of Queensland because we've got this successful business in Queensland we want to take that national um, we can do a bit of that organically um, but there are certainly opportunities for us to to grow by acquisition in that space right across the country you know it's a big market in WA it's a big market in South Australia so we've got an eye there um, we probably now in terms of a, a big um, consolidation style acquisition like Unispan was that's probably not on the cards now. It would probably be, as as you said, there probably more to do with other products that are you know ancillary products to the to the suite. And look, we've got a couple of those that we're looking at at the moment. Relatively small acquisitions who have a specific product that we know we could uh, you know, and, and a channel door market that we can open up and and would complement what we do. Yeah. And then, uh, if you just go back to the slide, uh, maybe on the margins. Um, I can't remember, I think it was the sixth or seventh slide. Um, just a question on where you think margins can get to like over the longer term or, or is this kind of the range that you, you kind of like to keep them at? Look, it's, a, it's an interesting discussion because, you know, we were traditionally, um, all, almost all of our earnings came out of hire and not much out of sales. And hire is sort of 100% pass through really. As you grow, as you grow your higher revenue, you don't drag a lot of cost along with it. Whereas obviously with sales, I mean, if we can make around about an average of 30 odd percent margin on sale of product, then we're doing really well. Um, so, you know, what you may find is we will grow our profitability and the margin, may, the actual margin may slightly shrink because you'll have more contribution coming out of sales with a 30% margin versus higher, where it's basically hundred percent pass through. Um, so look, I would like to think that we can maintain, uh, you know, an EBITDA margin of between 15 and 20. But if we're, you know, if we're at 15 or 16 rather than 20, it's going to be off a, it's going to be off a far bigger number because that's mean that means we're going to have been very successful in opening up our sales business. Okay, so it's down down to sales mix. Um, just a quick question, and somebody wanted to know, um, what are the two brokers who do cover you? Why are there two? No, what are the two? Just uh, the two, Bill, Bill Potter and Morgans. Bells and Morgans. Okay, great. Yeah. I think somebody's probably looking for a note there. Um, yeah. And then finally, uh, I think that's it. I think that was the last one. Let me just double check here. Yeah, that's it. Okay, perfect. We're going to finish just on the hour. Uh, Steve, thank you very much for your time. And thanks everyone else from joining in. As I said, this recording, uh, if you want to watch it back or um, check back through any of Steve's slides or Jim's slides, it'll be up on the YouTube channel probably by latest uh, on Monday.